our final speaker this evening is Jacob Phibbs. Jacob is a first year undergraduate student reading history at Homerton College. They won the right to speak through open audition. Jacob, the floor is yours. I want to thank you for that wonderful argument. It was, it was really well put. Um, we agree on a lot of stuff, which is really great. I'm quite surprised to hear. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and I just wanted to address a couple of things that have been mentioned in the chamber um, at the moment. Uh, so I'm not really sure what all this is about, about most Christians don't do anything. Um, I think it's just a minority that sit in a room and look at a mirror. I mean, I don't think you do that on a regular. I, I, I certainly don't. I mean, for goodness sake, they're monks. That's the whole point. Um, I mean, the Gospels are literally about Jesus going around and doing things. Uh, he wasn't just doing charity work, he was literally performing miracles. So, I don't know where you got that idea from. And the evidence of Christian doing things today, um, I mean, he, he, literally, he was a missionary. He literally went to Tanzania, so I don't know where that argument came from. Anyway, I shall begin my speech. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, so, good evening. Um, I'm here to tell you this evening that, contrary to the motion, these two identities are not separate. See, we do agree. The terms saint and sinner are intertwined. You cannot have one without the other. But first, I'm going to define these two terms. So, from the biblical understanding, a saint is a Christian. A saint is someone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ and has decided to follow him. When Paul the Apostle writes to saints in Rome or Ephesus, he is not writing to a small group of Christians better than all the rest because of special miracles they have performed. No, he's writing to all Christians in those cities. I understand that the term works slightly different under Roman Catholic doctrine, but seeing as we're living in a Protestant country, for the purposes of this debate, I would define it as I've said. Uh, no, thank you. The word, let me, let me do my definitions and we can chat later, or at the bar if, if maybe. Um, this word sin comes from the Hebrew katar. A direct translation is to miss the mark or to fail. Thus, as we agree, again, to be a sinner is to be a failure, to get things wrong and to make mistakes. That being said, I myself am a sinner. I get things wrong and I make mistakes. I am human. It is part of who I am. Again, we agree. Whether you believe in a positive or negative assessment of human nature, you all know that we as a species are capable of doing wrong. I mean, for goodness sake, we voted in Boris Johnson. <laughs> According to the poll I took, well, actually, I didn't take a poll, um, but 25 people in this room said that they saw themselves as sinners. I, um, I'm pretty sure there's more of you. Um, what if I told you today that that would no longer have to be the case? The fact you commit wrongdoing would no longer need to be a part of your identity. You could be a saint. Now, being a saint does not necessarily mean you no longer do wrong. It certainly does not mean you are perfect and have a pretty halo hovering above your head. In fact, it means that you acknowledge that you do make mistakes. Again, we agree that you do fail, that you do do things wrong. Whatever code of ethics you abide by, becoming a saint means that you commit yourself to a life where you are free of those restrictive definitions. Though you may fail and do wrong, no thank you, becoming a saint means that those actions no longer have any power over you. As, yes. I think for a lot of people, becoming a saint would mean putting aside something that they are, for example, being gay. And that would mean saying, that is a bit of that. I'll, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. That's not wrong. No, I, I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it is. I, I think we... we no, I think we agree. We agree. Carry on, I'll carry on. Um, you no longer find my set of moral codes and practices. You are defined by something far greater than anything you do. Before speaking to you here tonight, I asked a number of friends whether they regarded themselves as a saint or a sinner. Many of them were keen to tell me that they were very proud to be sinners. They were free in their lack of restriction. They were convinced that it was better to be a sinner because you came under no condemnation. Note it. Why pursue righteousness when it is unattainable? Notice they define themselves by negative actions they were able to commit rather than positive ones they had received. Um, I'm here to tell you today that if you decide to become a saint, you're immediately made righteous, not by the good of your actions, but what, by, by what you have accepted into your heart. But why is this better, you ask? Becoming a saint does mean you put new boundaries on your life. I'm not going to lie to you. It, it does. It means you put new restrictions. Yep. No, 
No, no, th thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's not, that's the, sh the shame about sexuality is not the Christianity I practice. Um, so I read the Bible, John 3, 1, 6, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that we should not perish but have eternal life. What do I notice about that? It says God so loved the world. It says God so loved the world. God did not just so love the heterosexuals. God did not so love the only the people that he called. God so loved the world. He loved everyone. Homosexuals, whatever. No, thank you. I've just answered it. Um, but why is this better you ask? Becoming a saint does not mean you've... Um, where was I? It does mean you've been restrictions in your life. I'm here to tell you today that becoming a saint leads to a freedom found nowhere else. Think of a football game without rules. What is stopping one player from using his hands or from tying another to a goalpost? Football is not the beautiful game without rules and guidelines. When those rules and guidelines are abused, England miss out on a World Cup final. Sin, or missing the mark and failing, can sometimes have dire consequences. When I told my dad that the turkey meatballs he had cooked me looked horrible, he got up, took my plate, and threw it out into the garden. We can all agree that my actions were wrong, and that his reaction was a direct result of what I had said. Getting things wrong does hurt, and it does have consequences. But being a saint means that you are forgiven for those mistakes. Being a saint means you are free because you are forgiven. It does not matter how many times you fail or do things wrong, because once you are a forgiven saint, once you are a forgiven saint, your actions no longer define who you are. I'm not saying that your actions no longer have consequences. Becoming a saint does not change what failure or, doing or making mistakes are. Saying that your dad's turkey meatballs look disgusting still mean they get chucked out the window. Picking up the football still ruins the game for everyone else. What I'm saying is that these actions no longer define you. As a sinner, the football player is one who ruined the game for everyone. As a saint, they are the talented player who had a bad day. Or better put, as a sinner, I'm the ungrateful eight-year-old that took my dad the food he had... No, thank you. Had spent hours preparing lovingly and had no value in my sight. As a saint, I am his son. No. Um, that is what being a saint means. It means you are set free because you are forgiven. You... Yes. Um, what if I reject the people that are forgiving me? You know, I look at the institutional guidelines that are set out by your church, you know, that say to be forgiven, you must go to church on a Sunday and repent. What if I reject the people? You know, you look at the Archbishop of Canterbury, who says he's not going to bless same sex marriages. I reject those people. Mm. Why should I place my life around? So, so. I, I don't, I, I've never been to a church where I've had to ask a man for forgiveness. I've, I, don't, I don't subscribe to that. I don't, I don't ask people for forgiveness. I don't, there's no one I need to reject because there's no human being I ask for forgiveness. Um, that's what being a saint means. It means you're set free because you're forgiven. You do not have to earn your freedom through your actions. It is given out of love. I'm not saying that as a sinner you are unloved or loved any less than a saint. Quite the contrary. I'm saying that you are loved as a sinner and you are loved as a saint. The difference is a saint has accepted that love. As a saint, your identity is not dictated by your good actions or your bad, but by the love you are given. As a recipient of that love, you are automatically made a donor. The love you have received as a saint is so abundant that it is impossible to contain. The feeling I can only liken it to is the equivalent of the time I was taken to Digland as a four-year-old. I was so overcome with excitement that I would get to ride all these diggers and become like my hero, Bob the Builder, that I burst into tears. The feeling was so overwhelming that I was unable to express it in words. It completely took over me. The love you are given as a saint is so magnificent that it is impossible not to share. Giving out that love is just like when you were young and you had made a wonderful piece of artwork at preschool or primary school and uh, it was destined for your family fridge and you could not wait to present it to your parents because of how much it filled you with joy. Saints are able to share this love because they have accepted it. Loved people, no thank you, I'm just coming to end. Loved people, love people. As a sinner, you have been made for this love. The natural progression is to receive it and become a saint. The identities are not separate, but two parts of a whole. You cannot be a saint without first being a sinner. The question then begs to be asked, how do you define, how do you become a saint? Well, 25 of people in this room are already there. It is admitting that you make mistakes and do get things wrong. And the second part is receive what has been given to you, to accept the love of a God who loves you. But what have we received? How do we know that there is a God that loves us? Because I believe that God came down and became one of us, that he chose to die the most excruciating death, and when he died, he took all our sin, all our failures, and all our mistakes onto himself. When he died, that sin was washed away by his blood, and he tore the barrier we had put between ourselves and God. He rose again so that you would no longer have to call yourselves sinners, but instead could become saints. 
And now Jesus extends this offer out to all of us, to everyone in this room. I ask you today, do you want to stay a sinner or do you want freedom, life in its fullness and a relationship with the God that adores you? Do you want to become a saint? Then come and follow Jesus. Thank you very much.